Hi, my name is Dirk. I'm an associate professor at Rotterdam School of Management in the Department of Technology and Operations Management. Why is inclusion more important for the future of education? I think the answer is pretty clear. Uh, we want to have all kinds of people involved in, in education, to benefit from education, to, to have the learning uh, journey uh, that suits them and that uh, fits best to their own needs and wants. I think we're striving much more as teachers, as a university, to make education more accessible. So not only focus on this one group of uh, students uh, that is yeah, the average uh, student, so to say, but to look into what are specific needs of our students. I think creating a lot of options is, is the way to go forward uh, because we know that we all learn also very differently. So what we are trying right now in this course that we offered is to, to have alternatives, have options, so that they can pick whatever fits best to their own needs and to design their own learning journey in the best possible way. I think Design for Inclusion plays a big role in making education more accessible and inclusive. This is something that I learned from Erasmus X to uh, appreciate and to value also and to take little bits and pieces into my own education. How do you want to submit your assignment? Uh, you can have a portfolio in a written way, you can have a video, you can have a podcast, but it can also mean in terms of the teaching material that we have uh, for our students. And funnily enough, if you do that, uh, then often what you see will, what you see is that actually it benefits a lot of m students. Some people might have um, problems reading or um, listening uh, to educational material. So I'm always so happy to see him. Unfortunately, he's not here today, but really thinking of him right now. I'm so excited to talk to you about this project. It's really uh, exciting for me to be here and share about this. We are going to specifically uh, talk on uh, some of the groups that are not always served very well yet in our university and how we can do better. So before I start and tell you all about this project, there's one more video. This comes from a student, and I think it's important we start with the student voice. So let's now listen to Fabian's story, and then we will dive in. Hi, and welcome to my digital story. Referring to myself as being disabled or even just functionally impaired, or by any other term that sets me apart from the status quo, still does not roll off my tongue over four years after I've suddenly lost most of my vision and sense of taste and smell in an accident. I feel observed and vulnerable if I let slip that I'm different, so I try my best to prevent that. Of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with being different or disabled or functionally impaired, but I notice that people treat me differently, they look at me differently once they find out or once I tell them that I'm, I'm disabled or functionally impaired in this sense, or perhaps I just convince myself that they treat me differently. I only go to the second semester of my bachelor's program before my life was split into two distinct phases before and after my accident. As you may notice, I really love cycling, and following my accident, I had to take a break from that. It seemed like I wasn't able to continue after all. I mean, I lost most of my vision, but after the accident, I was forced to continue with my new normal. I couldn't go back in time, of course. Everything was a struggle, and every day was a physical and mental pain. Even just finishing my bachelor's degree seemed like a silly pipe dream at times and the institution I studied at and its inflexibility and inaccessibility contributed to that sentiment. The university buildings and libraries that I had grown so accustomed to after months and countless hours spent in them, they suddenly felt forward and hostile. The courses I took, the stairs I had to climb, the doors I had to open, the digital systems I had to navigate, everything felt like they were designed to keep me and others like me out of the university and out of education. Places that had initially welcomed me with open arms, Sure, there are laws that govern accessibility, and universities generally pride themselves on being tolerant, accessible, inclusive, but unfortunately the practice is a far cry from what is promised on paper. Being stubborn and determined as I am, I eventually overcame these systematic boundaries. I figuratively and literally stumbled across these hurdles everywhere in life, and university just happens to be a significant part of mine nowadays as a master's student at Erasmus University Rotterdam. 
I've come to accept my condition and new limitations, and I've learned to overcome them with significant effort, despite the apparent institutionalized forces working against people like me. I feel like I beat the system on hard mode, not because I wanted to, but because I had no other choice. It's a constant and never-ending cycle of struggling and adapting from my end, and I wish it was more of a two-way dialogue between me and the university, so as to affect positive change within the institution. Yes. Yeah, so when we listen to uh, Fabian's story, I think it can be quite uh, loaded. <laughs> maybe uh, you are experiencing different uh, kind of feelings right now. Maybe you're thinking about uh, people around you or yourselves. It's an encounter with ourselves and with the other. And this kind of uh, is what we wanted to bring to the Design for Inclusion course. We wanted our own students to also be able to interrupt themselves and understand how to dialogue with people who might be different than them and how uh, can they be responsible in uh, building a better future. So some stats here, it's a, it's a very basic stats that uh, we often use from the Expert Center on Inclusive Education, ECIO. We estimate that there is around three uh, students out of 10 experiencing a functional impairment. So it's a really broad category that can also include uh, mental health issues. Uh, so we can uh, assume that perhaps 30% uh, of our students at the universities don't necessarily have their needs met. And I think that's not okay. So basically, that's the challenge we took. We wanted to really try to understand better how we can contribute positively uh, to this issue. And how can we also um, really dive deeper than just looking at this data that is given to us or what we see? Oftentimes, we just, you know, we, we see it's not that bad, it, it looks okay, right? But we don't really know the experience of people and, unless we actually listen. So we have to also look at other forms, uh, other ways of knowing. So one of them is to really listen to stories, like Fabian's stories, and understand actually there are uh, patterns of habits and, and structures, whether it is in the physical space, digital space, or even patterns of thinking and stigmatization, and all of these things are happening underneath, and we don't necessarily uh, confront them. So what kind of impact then can we make in that case? These are more stories, there are so many more stories, but at least these are coming to the surface and students are sharing uh, the challenges that sometimes they experience, uh, especially with the invisible disabilities as well, and how they can be misunderstood. Uh, so all of this really kind of drove this force for this project. We talked to a lot of students, also staff with the functional impairment, and then we slowly created this idea of how can we connect our students who are learning with the challenges that we experience here on campus? How can we engage in generative listening? Because listening is also a very good force and everybody here can actually do that, all right? So uh, I'm engaging you today, think about this. Generative listening in this case, it also comes from a theory like a theory U and system thinking. It's sense-making, so it is human-centered, it is co-created, co-generated with people at the same table, at the same level. So it doesn't mean that we're just collecting data, you know, <laughs> extracting from people, but also inquiring, observing, listening, interpreting together, and co-creating together. So what does it look like exactly in this project? Well, we had this three-week design thinking course. It was in partnership with RSM. And before the course started, we wanted to, uh, to have this workshop. So we had a consultant, Teti Dragas, who came in uh, to give us a storytelling workshop. We had students and staff who identified in uh, functionally impaired groups. They came and they shared their stories in these video stories, such as the ones from Fabian. Then these videos were put in the canvas, uh, so the digital platform of the students for their course. And, uh, around 110 students were involved in this course and they started their course, the, their design thinking process by empathizing and watching those videos. After that, they would collaborate directly with the creators of the videos and other panel members 
that were staff and, uh, and students at EUR with the functional impairment. So we created this dialogue. It was not always easy, but there was also a lot of encounters, uh, different types of encounters that we generated through this. And the students worked in different groups. They chose uh, the challenges they wanted to specifically uh, focus on, different challenges around inclusion and accessibility that were real at our university, and they started to prototype solution. So they really engage in this creative uh, way of uh, do doing design thinking. And finally, the teacher also was not only teaching design thinking, but te teaching through inclusive teaching practices by using universal design for learning approaches. And these will be covered in our workshop in the afternoon if you are joining us. So just an example of one of the group that uh, specifically worked with Fabian's story. Uh, so they watched the video, they talked to Fabian, they also talked to other people, they also looked for different sources of information in their challenge around how can we improve the experience of uh, people with a visual impairment at EUR. Then they slowly, uh, as designers, they need to you know, sometimes shift a bit their focus and specifically have a target group, which they discovered, and they try to integrate the pain points of, for example, Fabian and other users. So these are just snapshots of their work. And finally, uh, they were able to propose a prototype, which was, a, in their case, a mobility and navigation app. So within three weeks, students could find such a creative uh, solutions. So we really can tap the potential that we have right here on our, in our university, and we can see what can be done. So to kind of slowly end this, uh, I wanted to share some of the reflections from the students in the course. Many of them, they really belong to these, you know, seven students who don't necessarily have a, a specific need and uh, they are not confronted with differences. So for them, the first, I think, learning was uh, to be more aware of how to interact with people who are different than me and what can I learn from them? How can I ask the right question, make a mistake and learn from them? And how can I empathize with people? But also, how can I become more aware of my privilege, of the things that I didn't have to go through? And what is then my responsibility in the future as a designer? in so many ways, in my way of thinking and designing, but also just specifically, for example, in building a building. <laughs> so what's next, you're gonna ask me? Um, well, we are going to do this project again. This was in the fall 2022, so it's going to repeat again with a new set of students and improved uh, <laughs> aspect to the course. But also we want to go beyond this and we want to help more teachers or teaching f the faculty and student advisors and other educational staff at EUR to help them become more aware of what they can do, little things and bigger things, <laughs> that they can do to make our education more inclusive. So we are developing alongside with the IDEA Center, RISBO, SMF, and also the Student Support Services, Student Association, and many other people. We are developing a six-month program that will be launching in the fall 2024, and this is for teachers at EUR and also other campuses that also is EMC uh, and EUC. <laughs> so we would like to help all the teachers to, to have the tools and also to develop this kind of reflective mindset and how they can become more inclusive. Help them with that, with the actual practical stuff so that we can proactively create a more accessible and inclusive campus for our students. And that is why for me, the future of education is human.